Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about rationality in particular to support our discussion here in the context of the ethics and economic behavior course. And I'm gonna introduce this in the context of game theory and different solution concepts that are useful for exploring behavior. All right, so here we have my dog, Ani. It means way more to me to have on this page than it does to you. It's kind of code for myself so that when I save this video, that's gonna be the first, that's gonna be the thumbnail. So that's all that is. All right, my introduction. Well, our standard economic model for behavior is assuming our decision makers are selfish and rational. Motivated by behavioral economics, we realize maybe we should consider a richer model. But we have lots of questions such as, what do we mean by rationality? Uh, what behavior can we expect from rational agents? And then how should deviations from expected behavior be interpreted in co-players? And that's the key thing I'm gonna talk about here, which is how do we think about wh what type of, what follows as a consequence of assuming that, you're, that the co-player in a game or those that you're interacting with are also rational, and what happens if they behave in a surprising manner such that you've now seen a deviation, you've seen something other than what you'd expected. How do we think about how that player might be playing the game or how, we, how they might be making their decisions more generally? All right, so like I said, game theory is going to be the home for these slides, right? We're gonna do this in the context of game theory. And my important observation is that there's key concepts from game theory that we can think of as being really portable. We can take to apply to other areas. That's why this becomes a really important foundation for this rest that we'll do in the ethics and economic behavior course, right? We can apply the ideas from game theory in particular, from thinking about this slide deck, if only loosely to analyzing human behavior outside of like things modeled as games. Here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna think about best response I'll think about strategic dominance, I'll think about iterated elimination of dominated strategies, and I'll think about rationalizability. So it'll give rise to a number of different ways to think about solving games. All right, so the first thing is, if we're talking about a game, we have to have players, strategies, and payoffs, right? We need three things. It's, a game is a mathematical object with players, strategies, and payoffs. Ultimately, our players are, are selecting strategies so as to maximize payoffs. Now, in particular, strategies are more than just the actions in a game. Strategies are a complete contingent plan. It tells us how the player chooses whatever they could, whenever they're going to be called upon to play. Uh, from you know, given the combination of choices that they've made and, and the combination uh, of, of choices that their co-players have made. As a matter of fact, since a strategy has to be a complete contingent plan, a strategy has to tell us what a player would do even at unreached decision nodes in a game. So even if you're thinking like an extensive form game, and even if you have a situation where player chooses something that leads to the game ending immediately, if there's future nodes in that game, a strategy has to say what that player would do even at those unreached nodes. That's what we mean by a complete contingent plan. So it means a strategy is actually a much more complicated object than you might have thought of. All right, so even when a player chooses an action that will end the game on the first move, the strategy must tell us what they would do everywhere else, which is all, all just to summarize what I said a second ago. All right, so here's an example. Suppose we have Anne and Bob. Anne has actually, in this game, four strategies. Bob has two. So let me first talk about the game, then I'll explain the strategies. So at Anne's first node, Anne chooses to grab or to share. If Anne chooses to grab, Anne gets nine out of, say, $10. Bob gets one. If Anne chooses to share, now Bob is called upon to play. Bob can choose to trust Anne or can choose don't. If Bob chooses don't, Anne, the, the pie shrinks, and but Bob gets four out of now eight dollars. If Bob chooses to trust, then Anne is again called upon to play. Anne can then split or steal. If Anne splits, well, it's five dollars to each, and then I guess this is the same. Like this sort of maximizes social surplus, just as would initial initially grabbing. If Anne chooses to steal, Anne gets eight, and then Bob gets one. The first payoff, the first number goes to Anne. The second payoff, the second number goes to Bob. So now, 
Bob's strategies are obvious. Bob can either trust or don't. Anne's strategies are a little bit complicated. You'll notice they're going to say something about what Anne's going to do here and what Anne's going to do here. And so it's going to be share, split, share, steal, grab, split, grab, steal. Because Anne's strategy has to be a complete contingent plan. So even when Anne grabs, Anne's strategy involving grab has to tell us what Anne would do here if Anne were called upon to play. That's just part of the mathematical definition of a strategy. All right, so then we define strategies, but then also strategy profiles. A strategy profile is an n-tuple that describes the strategy played by all n players in a game. So if we've got two players, such as in this game, a strategy profile is going to take one strategy from Anne and one strategy from Bob, and this is going to allow us to pick out an end node where the game is finished, right? So one such strategy profile is grab, steal, and then don't. And if grab, steal, and don't is our strategy profile, the outcome that this is going to pick out is going to be what uh, is going to be a payoff of nine to Anne and a payoff of one to Bob. Notice this is non-unique because this is going to give us the same outcome. Grab, steal, and don't is going to give us the same outcome actually as grab, steal, and trust, <laughs> grab, uh, grab, split, and trust, uh, grab, split, and don't. Right? Why? Because what this is being governed by is uh, the fact that Anne's going to grab at the initial node. Anyway, so in the preceding example, a strategy profile will be a pair that reports Anne's strategy and Bob's strategy. Got it. All right, so now we have to start thinking about how players are actually going to play the game. So for this, we need a solution concept. We need a convention, a way to think about how the game's going to be solved. Right? Ultimately, we want to have a prediction that's then hopefully testable by virtue of having observed people play this game and look and see, does the empirical data match the theoretical data? If not, we revise the theory. The most, solution, the most famous solution concept you might have heard of is Nash Equilibrium. This is named for John Nash, who published uh, Nash Equilibrium in his PhD thesis in, what, 1950 at the age of 22. So Nash Equilibrium is kind of the, the famous one. It's kind of built around mutually best responding. And I've got some other videos. If you go into my search bar, you could find solving game. Probably the best one is like solving matrix games by the best response method. And it's the easiest way to find Nash Equilibrium. All right, so here I'll talk about some alternative solution concepts, dominant, dominant strategy equilibrium, rationalizability, and iterated elimination of, of weakly dominated strategies. Each of these solution concepts requires an assumption. Rational players will not play dominated strategies, right? We'll, we'll say that by virtue of being rational, we must not play a dominated strategy. What's a dominated strategy? Dominated strategy means that I've got some other alternative that's better than whatever is the dominated strategy. So here's those definitions. A strategy SI strictly dominates some other strategy, SI prime, if and only if playing SI is strictly better than playing uh, S for player I, no matter what the other players do. Actually, this what this lost a this lost a prime here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I I can't believe this. So this is actually uh, this is something I'll be able to fix. Hopefully, quite. Oh boy, in here in the middle of my video, as I've thought that this is going to be the most straightforward way to fix this problem. Um, maybe it's not. All right. <laughs> hey, how about that? So uh, I would edit that out if I cared at all about editing. Strategy S is a best response to the rival strategy S, uh, uh, not I, if and only if S I provides a higher payoff against uh, this than uh, to player I than anything else player I could do. All right, so let me kind of interpret this without the math. So the first thing, this is just saying this strategy strictly dominates some other strategy if this first strategy always gives me a higher payoff. Notice domination, right? Strict domination, weakly dominate, refers to how my strategies fare against each other, not how my strategies fare against my co-player, right? That's important. You might think, oh, dominate, this is game theory. This is... So first off, game theory is inappropriately named. It sounds like you're, it sounds like it's adversarial, and it's like kind of not the structure at all. Uh, you can think of like games that are coordination games where we're both trying to come up with a really good outcome. So it's kind of inappropriately named, but also then we start talking about dominant strategies. You can start thinking like I'm dominating or I'm winning or I'm doing something better than the other player. No, 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 no. Dominant strategy just means that it's my best alternative. Other things, other things equal. A best response 
to some this s not i this just means whatever the ra whatever my rival is doing this is a best response if it gives me a higher payoff than anything else while my rival plays this strategy we can have strategies that are best response to beliefs not even just best response to strategies and these can be like best a best response to a belief about a strategy right Strategy S is a best response to a belief if and only if playing the strategy provides the highest expected payoff conditional on uh, conditional on all the other strategies, uh, uh, conditional on the rival, my belief that the rival is going to use the strategy relative to all the other things that I could be doing. We further say that a strategy is a best response to some belief if and only if the strategy is undominated. And if, if we assume that if players are assumed rational then we can then all we can conclude is that no player will play a strictly dominated strategy all right this is all just to say you've got a best response if it if it's going to yield the highest payoff of all my strategies to whatever it is that the rival's doing right and so if my rival does something else um, I, my, I'll have to pick a new strategy and amongst all the other strategies I've got one of those will be my best possible response so okay let me get a, let me get away from this let me just give an example suppose we're playing the game walking down the hallway I'm walking down the hallway you're walking down the hallway we're kind of in this sort of awkward thing we're kind of in the middle not quite sure who's gonna go one way who's gonna go the other way all right I see you walk to whatever would be kind of like the left side of the hallway now, my best response, assuming that we don't want to run into each other, is for me to walk towards what would be my right side of the hallway, right? I've got other strategies. I could walk right towards you. That's not going to be my best response. My best response is going to be to walk to the other side, right? So, and that's my best response to your strategy of having walked to, the, to, the, like, to my left. Now, suppose I observe you walking to my right. Now, my best response to you walking to your right is me walking to my left, assuming that the highest payoffs are when we pass by uh, harmlessly, right? That's all this is. This all this is doing. Now, suppose this is talking about beliefs. Suppose I have in my mind the expectation that you're going to go to my left, your right. Why do I believe that? Well, we're in the United States, and in the United States, we commonly drive on the right and we commonly walk on the right. And so therefore, without even knowing, without even observe what you're doing, I'm believing you're going to go to the right. Therefore, I go to my right, right? You go to your right. That's my left. So I go to my right. And I, so my best, I have a best response to my belief about what you're going to do. All right. And then if players are assumed rational, we can we assume that no player will play a strictly dominated strategy. Um, I don't know. Like we could give me another strategy, which is just like to lay down in the hallway. Well, that's not a dominant strategy. My dominant strategy, my better response is to just walk past, right? Probably not to just flop on the floor, right? So if I'm rational, I probably don't flop on the floor because that's not my dominant, that's not my dominant strategy. That's a, that's a strictly dominated strategy, right? Okay, that's a little bit silly, but hopefully it kind of makes the point. Some new definitions. A strategy is strictly dominant if and only if it strictly dominates all of the other the player's other strategies, right? So strictly dominant just means you've got a strategy that's like always the best. It doesn't matter my other options, doesn't matter what you do, I've got something that's always best for me to do, right? That would be strictly dominant. Weakly dominant would be I've got a strategy that is gonna be, uh, that's gonna never be worse and sometimes be better, right? So I've got one strategy, it's, it's never worse than anything else I could do. It's maybe the same it's never worse and then there's at least some strategy of yours to which this strategy of mine is a strictly is strictly better right a weakly dominant strategy is one that's never worse and sometimes better right all right so now in this game we'd say a strategy profile so a strategy profile is a dominant strategy equilibrium if and only if for each player the strategy that's comprised in our that's included in our strategy profile is a weakly dominant strategy. So a good example of a dominant strategy equilibrium is the prisoner's dilemma game, right? So here's a prisoner's dilemma game. In the prisoner's dilemma, both players have a dominant strategy and their payoffs in the Nash equilibrium are lower than the joint payoffs in if they if they play their non-dominant strategies. So let's verify that. I've labeled best responses here. So what this is doing is saying, let's just take the perspective of column player or of row player. So suppose my column player, okay, so first off, so first, 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 the first 
number goes to is the payoff of the row player. The second number is the payoff to the column player. Right? So if we both choose C, player the row player gets two, column player gets two. If player if row player chooses D but column player chooses C, row player gets three, column player gets minus one. All right, suppose row suppose column player has chosen C. Row player's best response is D because three is better than two. Right? I do better, I like three better than two when I choose D rather than C. Suppose column player has chosen D, what's row player want to do? Well, row player could choose C and get minus one. They could get one if they choose D, so they should choose D. One is bigger than minus one. Actually, since I've underlined both three and one, we see D is always the best response. D is actually a dominant strategy. D, is, D dominates C. Since this game's symmetric, that's actually true from the other perspective as well. D is a dominant strategy for column player relative to column player's choice of C. Notice in equilibrium, payoffs are 1, 1. The sum of the payoffs is 2. The sum of the payoffs when they both play their non-dominant strategy is 4. That's also higher than this, which is 2, right? And so this is a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, not all games have a dominant strategy, but if a game has a dominant strategy, it must be part of any Nash equilibrium. And if both players have a dominant strategy, that will pick out the Nash equilibrium as it does here. All right. So if you want sort of more reinforcement of this logic that I just did here, search up my videos for, um, for solving matrix games by best response, and then I'll walk through that way more carefully. All right, so in the previous example, D is a dominant strategy for row player. D is a dominant strategy for column player. So there's a dominant strategy equilibrium, DD. When there's a dominant strategy equilibrium, we expect rational players are going to play it because players are not going to play dominated strategies, right? All right, most games don't have a dominant strategy, such as this one. This is a coordination game where we have two Nash equilibrium. You'd find them the same way as I just did a second ago by the best response method. We have one Nash equilibrium where we both choose A. We have another Nash equilibrium where we both choose B. The condition for a Nash equilibrium is that nobody would like to deviate alone. Nobody has a profitable unilateral deviation. And we can see that because what a unilateral deviation means is if, if, we're, if you're playing A and I'm playing A, I can't do any better by choosing B. I do worse, I get one, you get zero, right? Suppose we're down here though, and you choose B and I choose B, that's still a Nash equilibrium even though we'd both rather be at 5-5 five, five because the condition for a Nash equilibrium is that nobody has a profitable unilateral deviation. So even though, yeah, if we both change to AA, we're way better off, our payoffs increase by three. If I'm the only one to change, I'm losing two, I'm going down to zero. You're losing one, you go down to one, right? Okay, so most games don't have, don't have a dominant strategy. Ultimately, we care more about just rationality, we care about common knowledge of rationality. We care about the mutual expectation and belief that players are rational. So in game theory, we actually make assumptions about common knowledge of rationality. We assume, firstly, everyone's rational. Secondly, everyone knows everyone's rational. Thirdly, everyone knows that everyone knows everyone's rational to infinity, right? There's an interesting thing with common knowledge. There's a clip from Princess Bride that I like to show that kind of reinforces this, but um, I, won't, I won't search that up here just now. Only just to say, this is a strong assumption. Common knowledge of rationality is invoked even when what we mean is maybe a weaker version because common knowledge of rationality really does assume to infinity that can be really difficult to maintain but uh, we, we often don't need like the, the the strictest form but that's kind of uh, that's kind of assumption that we typically make is that people believe and then mutually reinforce the belief that the co-players are are rational and know that they're rational and so on and so forth all right, so now I'm going to define a new solution concept, iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies. And so this is something that gets away from Nash equilibrium, although sometimes it can pare down to a Nash equilibrium. So consider this game. So row player has two strategies, A and B. Column player has, two, has three strategies, X, Y, and Z. There's six strategy profiles given by the cells of this matrix. One strategy profile is AX, another is AY, another is AZ, then BX, BY, and BZ. So if row player chooses B and column player chooses Z, row player gets one, column player gets two. 
So what we're going to do, though, is we're going to take turns eliminated, eliminating strictly dominated strategies on the grounds that we believe that a rational player will never play a dominated strategy. All right, so firstly, we'll reflect on would a column player ever use strategy X if they believe that row player is rational? All right, so I'm column player. If I choose X, I get three or zero, depending on if row player chooses A or B. But if I choose Y, I get five or one, according to whether row player chooses A or B. Oh, I mean, immediately we see that if row player plays A, my best response is Y, because five is bigger than three, five is also bigger than four. If row player plays B, my best response is actually Z, because two is bigger than one is bigger than zero. We see actually X is never a best response, right? X is never a best response. A rational column player should never use strategy X. X is strictly dominated by Y, so X never, never gets used, right? Strictly dominated by Y. Notice Y is not the best response to B, but Y is a better response than X, right? Y strictly dominates. Y is always better than X for column player. So we're just going to strike X from the game. I'm just going to say that that's not going to happen. All right, so we pair this down to a smaller game. Now we consider the following. Would the rational row player ever use A against a rational column player? Well, wait a second. If I'm row player and I choose A, I get zero, regardless of what column player does. If I choose B, I get three and one. No, I'm never going to play A, right? And so A is never a best response. A is strictly dominated by B, so, ever, so A never gets used. We're going to remove A from the game. Now this is our game. Would a rational column player ever use Y against a rational row player? Oh, well, no, because two is bigger than one. I'm not going to play Y. I'm going to play two. I'm going to play Z, and I'm going to get two, right? Y is never a best response. Y is strictly dominated by Z, so Y never gets used. So the unique prediction of iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies is BZ, right? We move Y from the game. If row is rational, those column is rational, row must play B, similarly for column and for Z. We'd say that BZ is rationalizable. Right? I'm rationalizable. That's to say that it, sur it survived iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies. Interestingly, if iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies leaves a single outcome, it is the Nash equilibrium. So if you solve this game by best response method, find the Nash equilibrium, it'll be BZ. Right? Um, so for finite games, the order of elimination won't affect the outcome. If everyone knows the other player if everyone knows the other player is rational, then every player must use a rationalizable strategy. Any rationalizable strategy is consistent with common knowledge of rationality. What's the problem? Often there can be too many rationalizable strategies. So suppose we think of like, uh, suppose we think of a situation where there's not strictly dominated strategies. Now we have a problem. Iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies will lack cutting power if we don't have strictly dominated strategies, such as consider this game. This is a new game. Both players have option A and then option B or strategy A and strategy B. I mean, we have a Nash equilibrium here, so that's going to be AA. There's a problem, though. BB is also a Nash equilibrium, right? So let's check our definition, Nash equilibrium. If we're if you're playing B and I'm playing B and I switch to A, oh, I get zero. That's not a profitable unilateral deviation, nor is it for you, right? So both AA and BB are Nash equilibrium, although we don't like BB for some reason. Let's take a look at this. Let's try, let's, let's realize, oh, all strategies uh, survive iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies. We don't have any strictly dominated strategies. Strictly dominated means that you've got something that's worse no matter what you do. Well, that's not true because B is the same if you choose B, right? Row player's choice of B is the same, zero, if column player chooses B uh, as it is to choose A, right? So what happens is we have to switch to look at iterated elimination of weakly dominated strategies. It turns out each player has a weakly dominated strategy. It turns out B is weakly dominated by A. So in the absence of strictly dominated strategies, iterate elimination of strictly dominated strategies lacks cutting power. It can't pare down this game. But we'll say a rational row still doesn't play B when row thinks A is possible, and a rational column will not play B when column thinks A is possible. 
And so if we eliminate this on the grounds of, if we eliminate this on the grounds of uh, weakly dominated strategies, then we can get rid of B and B and pare down our game again to just A or just AA. So we have, uh, so we have uh, AA is the surviving strategy profile. Uh oh, so we have a kind of a key observation though, which is like, we got rid of a Nash equilibrium. Now we might have some reasons to be suspicious of the Nash equilibrium BB, but it was a Nash equilibrium nevertheless, and it was eliminated by iterated elimination of weakly dominated strategies. That's something to be aware of if you're applying the solution concept to realize this could get rid of Nash equilibrium. Sometimes that's what you want, sometimes it's not. All right, so the last thing I wanna do is look at extensive form games. So here is the original example, Anne can choose to share or grab, Bob can choose to trust or don't, and then chooses to split or steal. Right, so we have two solution concepts, backward induction, backboard, backboard induction, no, backward induction. How did, this is like, this is like an auto, auto correct. Ah, uh, here I'm trying to, here I'm trying to fix this and I'm causing worse problems for myself. That's not gonna do it either. We want this to be backward, backward induction. I don't know, it's probably my neighbors playing basketball probably when I did this, I don't know. I'm um, right right there. I don't know if you can hear him now. Anyway, so backward induction uh, begins at the end of the game, whereas with Anne's move, right? And it takes to heart the idea that rational players are not going to play dominated strategies. Oh, now as I'm here, I've been hidden behind my microphone. I see that I'm, I see that my image is lagged. So that's not good. Backward induction, we go to the very end of the game. We're going to say, okay, well, Anne's not going to play a dominated strategy, right? Well, Anne's payoffs are the first ones. Uh, split is worse than steal. Eight is better than five, right? So Anne's not going to play split. Anne's going to play steal. And so what I'm going to do, oh, this again. So what I'm going to do is I am going to shade over steal because I believe that when called upon to play, Anne's going to play steal, not split. Bob's going to realize this. So looking forward at Bob's move, Bob realizes, oh, well, I can trust and get one or I could don't and I can get four, so Bob's gonna choose don't. All right, now looking forward, Anne's gonna say this eight's not on the table because when called upon to play, Bob's gonna choose don't, so this four is what I'm comparing to this nine. Oh, I like nine better than four, so I choose grab. So the backward induction solution actually gives us the Nash equilibrium we had from before, uh, or I didn't say it was a Nash equilibrium, did I? Um, gives us the strategy profile we had from before, nine, one, right? So the backward induction solution, you go to the end of the game and then you find what's consistent with rational behavior. And so this actually gives us a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium in, in a game like this. All right, so forward induction begins at the, at the beginning of the game. There's no formal definition in the literature. People don't perfectly agree on forward induction, but the basic idea is we need some way to be able to interpret the observed moves in a way consistent with rationality. So here, Unlike the other solution concept, forward induction maintains the belief of rationality even in the face of unexpected moves. That's the basic idea. So let's so begin with backboard. Backboard again. Well, easy enough. I'm just going to bring this forward and copy paste. Can I do that? No, I can't. It's driving me crazy. All right. So backward induction at the beginning, at the end of the game. Eight was bigger than five. We expect Anne to choose steal. If we can figure this out, so can Bob. So Bob chooses don't because four is bigger than one. Surely Anne figures this out as well. So Anne should choose grab because nine is bigger than four. I'm gonna take a picture of this and try to try to fix that later. All right, so the backward induction solution is grab, steal, and don't. All right, that was just the outcome where Anne got nine and Bob got one. So you might be familiar with backward induction already if you've gone through your intermediate micro. Now let's think about forward induction. This begins at the beginning of the game. The backward induction solution is the unique subgame perfect equilibrium, and Bob's information set is actually off the equilibrium path, right? It's Bob's Bob's not called to play in subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. The game should end with Anne's initial move. So then the question is, well, Bob realizes in equilibrium, Bob should never have a move, but what if Bob finds Bob's self asked to play? All right, well, if I'm called upon to play, something weird happens, so what should Bob believe? Well, when off the equilibrium information sets are reached, Bob should actually not suppose this is by accident, 
right? Bob should continue to use, should not believe this is by accident and continue to use equilibrium strategies. Bob should consider what could have happened and didn't in forming belief of, about what's likely to happen next. And he should, Bob should continue to believe that Anne is rational. So when Bob's surprised by being called upon to play, Bob should reflect on the fact that Anne gave up a payoff of nine. At nine, that's Anne's highest pay, uh, at nine, that was Anne's highest possible payoff. When that was on the table, Anne skipped it and gave Bob the opportunity to play. Anne could still get the eight, which is still pretty good. Then Bob would get one, uh, but gets five after split. Now, interestingly, as long as Bob maintains the belief that Anne's rational, he's got a reason that Anne intends to give him a higher payoff. So looking at the game, I'm saying, wait a second, if I'm called upon to play here, I'm Bob, I find myself in the, in the game, I realize, wait, Anne gave up this nine. It'd be irrational of Anne to give up this nine to get that eight. That didn't help Bob at all and it hurt Anne. So if Bob's gonna maintain the belief that Anne's rational, Bob has to believe that Anne intends to give Bob the five five, right? So that's this right here. Uh, all right, so Bob should choose, so if this is the case, Bob should reason that Anne is interested in giving him five rather than four. Bob should choose trust. So right now we should assume the outcome to be share, split, and trust, which rests on players believing and maintaining beliefs in the rationality of their co-players. Suppose they intend to play share, split, trust. Is Anne still rational? Is Bob still rational? It's interesting, reflecting on what we mean by rational, right? Anyway, so... The point of this discussion is to give us some formal tool, some terminology to be able to describe how players can interpret the actions of their co-players. If players observe a surprising move, they must instead update their beliefs about strategies being used in order to maintain the belief in the rationality of their co-players, right? Uh, not all interactions are as obvious as in the centipede example that we just saw. There could be more complicated games, but in general, we can assume players in games um, we can assume players in games and indeed people in reality are going to use a similar approach to interpret observed behavior and to try to update and maintain the belief in rationality. All right, anyway, so I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm going to go ahead and conclude here.